Good morning, everybody. Great to be here. And what I'm going to talk about today is something that Martin Muldoon and I have worked on, that we've also recently, well, I in a different context with a, another co-author, have found a, a small error specifically for the case of quadratic polynomials. So you'll see that in this talk, which uh, when I had discovered the error, uh, we have to change all our papers to have n greater than or equal to 3, uh, because it goes back to a, a famous classical theorem, which I now have a counterexample for. So all very interesting from that point of view. But you'll notice that when I specify n greater than or equal to 3, in uh, talking about the zeros of these polynomials, there is a point to it. Uh, it. It in fact doesn't hold for n equals 2 and all along for all these years everyone has thought that it does. So I'm going to talk about zeros of ultraspherical and what are called pseudo-ultraspherical polynomials. It's joint work with Martin Muldoon who's at York University. So the theme of the talk is the Location of the zeros, these are orthogonal polynomials, and I'll talk in a moment about why that's important. Why do we care if a polynomial sequence of polynomials is orthogonal? The answer is because they have very nice properties. This zero space and they're very useful in numerical quadrature applications, for example, and also in many other situations. They're also solutions of important second-order differential equations in physics. We're going to talk about the zeros as the ultraspherical's of consecutive degree. So one polynomial has degree 5, say, and the other has degree 4. The zeros are all real, they lie in a specific interval, and they satisfy a particular property called interlacing, which I'll discuss in a moment. Outside of orthogonal range, you'll notice that my polynomials here, this is a pointer, no, they're a red line. Ah, you'll notice that the ultraspherical polynomials, the degree of the polynomial is n, and there's a parameter lambda. For certain ranges of values of lambda, the polynomial sequence is no longer orthogonal, but it does have some semblance of orthogonality, it's called quasi-orthogonal, and I will be uh, discussing what that means and why it's important. And then to talk about ultraspherical and the concept of pseudo-ultraspherical polynomials, which was defined by Morad Ismail uh, about 13 years ago. So that's the plan for the talk. The ultraspherical's are special cases of the well-known Jacobi polynomials, Pn alpha beta, equal to beta, equal to lambda minus a half. So they are special cases of the well-known classical orthogonal sequence. They're orthogonal on the interval minus 1, 1. What does that mean? Well, this is one way of looking at it, that the integral from minus 1 to 1 of any positive integer power of x times cn lambda of x multiplied by the weight function, which is this guy here. Integrate that with respect to the ordinary uh, um, the big measure dx. You get it as it's zero for any power of x up to and including n minus 1. The integral is non-zero for k equal to n. That's just the square of the L2 norm of the polynomial. So there's nothing terribly difficult there, but it is important that this integral holds for k equals 0 up to n minus 1, because I'm going to be relaxing that slightly when I talk about um, quasi-orthogonality in a moment. The great property of the zeros of any orthogonal polynomial of degree n and n minus 1 is that in between Successive zeros, x1n and x2n, these are the zeros of the polynomial of degree n. There is exactly one zero of the polynomial of degree n minus 1. So you've got n zeros, it creates n minus 1 intervals, if you like, within the interval minus 1, 1. And one of the zeros of pn minus 1, or in this case cn minus 1 lambda, is exactly in that uh, interval. 
So we say that the zeros of Cn minus 1 and Cn interlace. Now, apart from being quite pretty, it's quite a nice little result that these zeros slot in in a nice preordained way. Why is that useful? Well, it keeps control. You know what's happening with the zeros. They can't wander far out. So if you know where the zeros of Cn are, you know that all of the other uh, polynomials have zeros lying inside that and, and they never go inside. I mean the zeros. Oh, you can have common zeros, but not for alt That's a wonderful question. That's a very deep problem. Can uh, two orthogonal polynomials of non-consecutive degree have common zeros? And the answer is yes. The, the game is on to try to quantify are the zeros, do they are the zeros, <coughs> or how do we quantify the common zeros? So common zeros are always where interlacing properties but for consecutive degree, no, they are always co-prime. They never have common zeros of a sequence. You all okay still? Okay, good. But notice something that is completely trivial in this context here. So that is the classical interlacing, as it's called, of the zeros of consecutive degree orthogonal polynomials. Notice though that if I add to one and one to the zeros of polynomial of degree n minus one gets interesting here too. I'm going to be a pretty trivial obstacle. Okay, I've talked the parameter. This orthogonality only holds. The integral only converges. But it lambda is greater than minus. So what happens as this parameter decreases to minus a half? Greater than minus a half, it's a wonderful sequence and we know everything about it. What happens now is two zeros depart from the interval through the endpoints. Okay? And the only lambda range the part of the orthogonal range in which all the zeros are real and simple, and you'll notice for n greater than or equal to 3, we found that for n equals 2, the argument given in Shohat's 1937 theorem breaks down, and we have specific examples of uh, ultraspherical polynomial of degree 2 having two pure imaginary zeros, which is a long way from being real. So this is uh, what I was talking about at the beginning of the talk, and I apologize, it's very obscure. That's very, it's not uh, going to be in the talk until a couple of weeks ago. So <laughs> that's quite new. Okay, so for the first integer range of the lambdas, life is still quite good, and you have what we call quasi orthogonality. What is that? It means that it was a concept introduced by Riss in 1983 connection with the mode problem. Uh, it's a, a very useful concept. And what it means is that, oh, that's blocked there because of this. Uh, that's yeah. One can see it on the other side. Oh, can you? Ah, good. Okay. So you'll notice, please look at the other screen just for this here. The ultraspherical polynomials, if lambda is less than minus a half, was your order to, and you still have an orthogonality type condition, but it only goes up to n minus 3 and not up to n minus 1. So that is different from the orthogonality condition. So you lose something when your parameter is below minus a half, provided it stays larger than minus 3 up to you have this phenomenon. Uh, okay. In a paper with uh, Claude Brzezinski and Michele Rodivo Zaglio, who visited WITS in 2003, we proved that the zeros of Cn lambda lie exactly in this case. So I've got it at the top there. I'm hesitating because I haven't uh, emphasized this range of lambda. Two zeros lie outside the interval minus 1, 1. <coughs> Excuse me. With Marcel Dune later, 
One of the problems we couldn't solve in our paper with the uh, Claude and Michela was whether the zeros of quasi orthogonal order two polynomials are still interlacing. I don't know why we couldn't do it. Of course, when you find out how to do something, it always looks easy. And uh, we should have been able to do it for 12 years with a penny to drop. And what you get is look at what's going on here. Uh, here are my zeros of CN lambda. I'm in this range where I have quasi orthogonality of order 2. So I have this situation. But the smallest zero polynomial of degree n minus 1 is outside the interval formed by the zeros of Cn. So in order to have interlacing, and this was why I made that trivial observation before, look at what's going to happen if I add the point minus 1 to my polynomial of degree n minus 1 to restore interlacing. Everything that is going on. The yes, zeros so actually introduced that to create that. Correct. So I create a new zero at one and at minus one, and it's trivially satisfied in the orthogonal case, and it restores interfacing in the quasi orthogonal case. That was the observation there. So you don't, you definitely don't have interlacing of the within the pure sequence of quasi orthogonal polynomials, but if you as we'll see, if you add one to the polynomial of degree n minus one, this one's now got degree n plus that. Okay, so that's got degree two more than n minus one, and this is polynomial of degree n, and you can see quite clearly uh, the way in which we proved these results was by using what are called mixed three-term recurrence relations, which allow you to vary the parameters as well as degree of the polynomial. So the technique is not very deep or difficult, I'm ashamed to say. Uh, it's really quite some mathematics, if you like. The key, of course, is always to see what you can use. So it's not all about uh, heavy machinery. It's sometimes just about uh, realizing what you've got there. OK, so what happens if you allow lambda to decrease further? And you'll see in a moment why I'm interested in this. As soon as the zeros that escape from the interval, as soon as you lose orthogonality, they're dying to be free. They want to be free, they want to become complex, they want to be away from the others. <coughs> okay? That is the, the pattern of uh, zeros of orthogonal polynomials. So each time the parameter decreases successive half integer, so minus 3 over 2, minus 5 over 2, minus 7 over 2, and so on. You have another pair leaving. And the first drop that leaves through minus 1 and 1, because the coefficients of C and lambda, they can't be complex. They've got to stay real, uh, because they've all got complex conjugates that are also zero. Okay, but as soon as they can, they become complex. And certainly they want as much freedom as they can. So this is the situation. And eventually, the zeros start accumulating, <coughs> and we have proofs of this as well. Going back to a paper with Peter Durham that I wrote in the year 2000, the zeros of the ultraspherical polynomials, as you let the parameter decrease successively further and further, they eventually start reappearing on the pure imagination axis. Okay, so it's a wonderful phenomenon, and it's, it's specific to the ultraspherical polynomials. I don't know that there's any other sequence of polynomials whose zeros display this kind of behavior as you allow the parameters to decrease. So they, they're all real to start with, then they're too real, then they become complex in pairs, and then they start appearing on the uh, pure imaginary axis. So it's really a very beautiful situation. And using uh, 2F1 hypergeometric functions, which Manfred and I wrote some nice papers about the zeros of as well, uh, with Peter Duran in 2000, we proved that once lambda becomes sufficiently small, all, <coughs> all of the zeros of CN lambda are purely imaginary. They all lie on the imaginary axis. So we all know how to make them real, just by our eye. Now they're all on the so now I've got 
a new orthogonal sequence, Cn lambda ix, okay, provided lambda is less than minus n. This all sounds very, very nice. There's something very important here that I want to highlight. The orthogonality of the sequence holds lambda greater than minus a half. It doesn't depend on n, the degree of the polynomial. Okay? Or lambda greater than minus a half. Here, I have a dependence, a relationship between the parameter lambda in the ultraspherical polynomial and the degree of the polynomial n. And there's no escape. Okay, so depending on how negative lab is, I only have a finite sequence. It's not an infinite sequence of orthogonal polynomials. So there are important differences between the ultraspherical's and what I'm going to define multiplying by i. I'm going to get the pseudo ultraspherical. So it's a very simple uh, construction. It's strongly motivated by the behavior of these zeros, and all this is, is properly. Uh, proved and analyzed. Also, the angles of arrival and departure of the zeros at the interval n point six one one. That's all known, all very well understood and, and analyzed in various papers. So note the connection between lambda and n. This means I'm only going to have a finite sequence. Well, what about the general orthogonality of Jacobi polynomials? That was uh, discussed using Riemann-Hilbert methods, but Arne Kaler and Andre Martinez and Ramon Arif in, in 2003. And in fact, you can show that you have a type of orthogonality in the complex plane that is uh, not restricted to the uh, traditional values of the parameter lambda. So that was some very deep and interesting work. But looking at the complex orthogonality of uh, ultraspherical polynomials, Jacobi polynomials. We can go back to a paper of Richard Askey, and I have to tell you that Helmut Prodinger and I reinvented this. We submitted our paper, I still have a copy of it, and it turned out that it was published by Richard Askey in the Journal of Indian Mathematics, and no one knew that it was there, including us. But the referee must have been Richard Askey, because he said, Sorry, guys, this has been done. So Helmut and I never got that paper published that we discovered this uh, complex orthogonality of the Jacobi polynomials. In this case, I'm taking the special case because we don't want to have messy old alphas and betas. I'm just looking at the special case of ultraspherical. Remember, ultraspherical are where the two Jacobi parameters are equal. So this was the case when you have ix here. The weight function changes from 1 minus x squared to 1 minus ix all squared. Which is 1 plus x squared, so it really is very simple. The integral orthogonality becomes infinite, it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. But again, though, you need this m plus n plus 2 lambda to be negative. So again, there is a dependence between the degree of the polynomials m and n and the value of the parameter lambda. All right, Ismail made the obvious definition, and the constant in front is just for convenience. And with this definition of the so-called pseudo-ultraspherical polynomials, that's what the definition is, and it's motivated by how the zeros behave as lambda decreases. You get this uh, orthogonality here, which is just a translation of the ASCII result. So that was from Murad Ismail in 2005, and now, my question was, we know something about the zeros of the orthogonal ultraspherical polynomials. We know the connection between the ultraspherical and the pseudo-ultraspherical. We've got the stuff going on where the pseudo-ultraspherical then have risk. Is there a connection between the two? And it's not that uh, it's a very beautiful result. It's very simple, and it comes out of an observation of Richard Askey's and a formula in a well-known book of uh, formula tables. So nothing terribly new, nothing very deep, nothing very difficult, but very, very pretty. Uh, and this was uh, in the paper in the Journal of Mathematical Analysis and Applications. I'm going to define a new lambda prime 
and that's motivated by this motion of the zeros as lambda decreases. If we denote the zeros of the ultraspherical polynomial with parameter lambda and the zeros of the, sorry, pseudo ultra with parameter lambda and ultra with parameter lambda prime, where this is the relationship between the two lambda prime and lambda, notice the dependence on m as well, then what you get is that the reciprocal of the square, look at what this maybe isn't written the nicest way, I've got 1 over x n k tilde lambda squared is 1 over that guy squared minus 1. So it's a very beautiful, very simple formula connecting, if you have this connection between the parameters, you also have this connection between the zeros of the ultraspherical and the pseudo-ultraspherical Okay, so in the orthogonal case, that's what it looks like. This is in some sense just a summary. And now, as we've seen, you get a finite sequence. And you do have interlacing of zeros of polynomials of consecutive degree. Now, once I have a finite sequence and I've got interlacing, a new phenomenon comes to mind. If you have n points real and n minus one real and they are interlacing in the sense that between any two consecutive of the n points there's exactly one of the others, you can form the polynomials with zeros at the n points and the n minus one points and embed those in infinitely many orthogonal sequences. It's called Wendroff's theorem, and it was in the proceedings of the AMS in 1961. So once you've got a finite n, you've got the zeros of the polynomial of degree n, and you've got the zeros of the polynomial of degree n minus 1. If you know that they interlace, you can then form orthogonal sequences with those as your sort of basis. Notice that for different n, you'll get different sequences. Okay, so this is very uh, much of use also with uh, numerical methods in, in the applications. Okay, the weight function, this is the open problem which is being slightly obscured there. The ASCII integral converges for m plus n plus lambda less than a certain amount. The weight function is 1 plus x squared to lambda minus a half and as ASCII showed, for lambda less than minus n. But we've got orthogonality and, and everything and zero is it for lambda less than 1 minus n. It's an open problem what the weight function looks like. Nobody seems to have any good ideas. What is the weight function? We know we've got orthogonality, but we don't have any idea what the, the weight function looks like if lambda lies between minus n and, and 1 minus n. So that's an open problem that we have here. Okay, the other interesting thing is if you take the square of these polynomials and subtract 1, you're going to find that in that first quasi-orthogonal range, so I've got quasi-orthogonal order 2 ultraspherics, that's the relationship if lambda is a half minus lambda prime minus n. Remember what happened as the zeros left the interval. One became less than minus one, one became bigger than one. Okay, so two of the zeros have got modulus greater than one. Okay, for the simple, pure, ultraspherical with lambda outside the interval orthogonality. Inside the interval orthogonality, they're all in minus 1, 1. If I let lambda go between minus a half and minus 3 over 2, there are exactly 2 in 2, 0 outside the interval. Okay, so they have modulus greater than 1. And if you do very simple arithmetic, you find that the corresponding zeros of the pseudo ultraspherical polynomials are purely imaginary. So there's no interlacing of. of of consecutive degree in the ultra sequence or in the corresponding pseudo ultras.
Okay. This is the extension also of a result of Demitar Dimitrov and Murad Ismail and, and Rafael in 2013 that when you change the value lambda, remember the weight function is 1 minus x squared to the lambda minus a half. If you mess with lambda, you're changing the weight function. And they looked at this whole idea of interlacing of zeros and how it breaks down as a property of modification of the measure with the weight function. Okay, so that's, that's a way of doing that. And we can view it in that way. This is just a, a summary um, of the situation that we have. But look at this. We've got a modification of the measure. Those, we've got no ending, but these guys do. So the two polynomials by Wendorf's theorem can be embedded in infinitely many orthogonal sequences. And this is the topic of a uh, rather recent work I, I visited the University of Colorado Springs a couple of months ago for a long visit. Uh, and Oksana Beeman and I are looking at the properties of the zeros of polynomials in these orthogonal sequences generated by Wendrop's theorem. I, I mentioned that to you. So we're finding very interesting situations. So what we're taking is our one polynomial is Cn plus 1 equal to this guy. The other one is Cn equal to that guy. Embed them in orthogonal sequences. What relationship is there between the orthogonal sequence that you generate in some sense artificially and the original sequence of spherical polynomials? Can you say anything about the zeros? Can you say anything about the, the matching uh, situations? So that's quite interesting also from a numerical point of view. 1 and minus 1 are rather easy points to have as interpolation points in a quadrature rule. So there are many uh, nice applications coming out of this. One of the things that we can also prove uh, in the paper with Martin Muldoon, and I won't go into any of these details here, is that you have this interlacing provided you add the zeros of 1 and minus 1. And more than that, this factor, this quadratic factor, is sharp. You can't improve it. Okay, it's the only quadratic multiplicative factor that restores interlacing. And we, we could actually prove that by using asymptotics uh, of the zeros of ultraspherical polynomials. So that's also a result that we have. And it follows from the bounds, uh, the, the extreme zeros approach plus or minus one. So if you give me an epsilon, I can give you an n and, and, and I'll find a contradiction. Okay, so that uh, followed from that work on the extreme bounds. We've got bounds for the zeros uh, of the ultraspherical polynomials in the uh, quasi-orthogonal order 2 case. Thank you.